The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the individual co-host and do not reflect the official policy or position of the Firearms Radio Network and or their employers. Viewer discretion is advised. This is especially true on our live shows. Broadcast for shooters, hunters, and gun enthusiasts, this is the Firearms Radio Network. The bandwidth for this episode of This Week in Guns is sponsored by Patriot Patch Company. PatriotPatch.co Welcome to This Week in Guns. This show is brought to you by the Firearms Radio Network and Patriot Patch Company. And this show offers commentary on the latest firearms industry news, information, and buzz. I'm your host, Sean Heron, and I get to introduce our guest tonight, as I do every week. Uh, first up, we got my buddy, Chief Leadhead and host of Talking Lead, Lefty in the House. What's up, man? What's up, Leadheads? <laughs> How's it going, buddy? <laughs> All right, next, up, next up, we got... Hello. Formerly of Red Jacket Firearms in the TV show Sons of Guns. Currently, he's doing great work and the head honcho and the owner of Atlas Defense, Joe Mo in a house. What's up, Joe? What's up, guys? How are you? Good, man. Glad to have you guys here. I'm excited. I'm excited. Uh, first it's off, a good show. it's going to be fun, man. It's going to be fun. I don't know if it's going to be good, but it's going to be fun. And I think that's the important part. Uh, before we kick everything off, I just want to encourage everyone to go to Patriot Patch Company and check out their Patch of the Month Club. You get cool patches every single month in the mail. It's like Columbia House, except you don't have to send them back, and they don't send you collections notices when you don't pay for them. You have to pay for them in advance, just to be clear. So go to PatriotPatch.co and get started on that. First story, guys, Vox shows diminishing support for gun control. This comes to us from BearingArms.com, and Vox is a pretty left-leaning magazine, I think you could say, but it's I was going to ask you what Vox is. Yeah, VOX. It's a left-leaning type thing. It's a, I, don't, I don't know if it's a magazine Never or a Never heard of it. <laughs> Never heard that's, of her. <laughs> that's just a sign of the times, and it shows you that gun control really is uh, – the only backing is an emotional backing. People that support it, uh, it's an emotional response. That's why it's a temporary response. It peaks after a shooting like Parkland or Aurora or any of the others that are absolutely tragic events. And probably could have been stopped and helped in numerous ways, not to mention a, a concealed carry holder or somebody armed in the scene. Yeah, without question. So there was an NPR PBS NewsHour Marist poll, and it found that 51% of Americans support stricter gun laws in the United States in this poll. And while that's still a tiny majority, it's way down from after Parkland when 71% of Americans said gun laws should be tightened. Next in the article said 42% of Americans believe that stricter gun legislation should be an immediate priority for Congress in a survey conducted in April after Parkland, 52% said. So we as Americans do have short memories. Marty, what do you think about all this? Well, I don't hold a lot of stock in polls either. Yeah. It depends on who's running the poll. You're going to get the the desired results that you want for whatever side you're trying to lean on. So that 51%, I guarantee people that were running that were on the left and they wanted to squeeze out over, you know, half the majority with that. So I take it all with a grain of salt. Do your own research, do your own critical thinking, you know, pull facts from several different areas, not just one source. Even, you know, even go the opposite side with your sources too, because you got to see what both sides are saying about it. Yeah, I 100% agree. But same question, same, same place, uh, almost a year apart and a 20% drop. That's, that's definitely that's, yeah. good, good news in my opinion. As long as they're being consistent with their, their sources, then yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's that's absolutely it's an emotional response. <clears throat> yeah, it's always been and it's always used as such as an emotional response. That's the only that's the only ammunition that that the gun control advocates really have. Yeah, I 100 percent. That's the agree. number one rule in politics is never let a tragedy go to waste. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I mean, that's that's what they live by. Absolutely. man. Both sides. Check out this next story. Dallas officer sues Facebook, Twitter, and Google for radicalizing terrorists. Um, I thought this was kind of an interesting one. This guy got shot. He was a DART, which is a, like a rapid tra uh, transit authority cop and uh, got caught by a guy who had been, I don't know if he had been radicalized on Facebook, but he was using uh, Facebook to basically to, to come in contact with ISIS or whatever terrorist organization that he was with. And, uh, this officer is now suing those three, but basically for allowing a platform of, of uh, allowing a platform where these people can can share messages and and ideologies of hate and things like that. Mm -hmm. I have a definite opinion on this, but I do want to hear from you guys, Marty. I'll start with you. 
So I think the the group that he was asso- or they he was trying to associate with was the Black Panthers or the the new Black Panthers, whatever that is. I don't think it was ISIS. Yeah, a Nation um, of Islam, the Black Riders Liberation Army, and yeah. Uh, but as as most of these mass murderers, you know, come out after the story comes out, it turns out that they've got some sort of you know mental issues. Um, and this guy was a he was a veteran. And I think he was in Afghanistan and he was around a lot of mortar fire and he probably had some TBI or, you know, something along those lines. I don't know what he was diagnosed with. I didn't read that far into it. Um, but I, th- I think this guy's issues a lot more than being uh, radicalized. But I do agree that you know, these social media platforms are very one way leaning. And I think we feel it more than, than anybody being in the gun and the firearms industry and in that we see it more and more every day where we're getting choked down on our post. And you're like, I was trying to boost, you know, just saying, letting people know that I was going to be on your show tonight. Mm-hmm. And they wouldn't let me boost that. <laughs> That's silly. There was nothing to do with guns or anything. You know, I didn't tag anybody. I just said, Hey guys, come and come and watch us tonight on the uh, firearms radio network. Wow. And that was it. And they wouldn't let me boost that. That's, that's ridiculous. Joe, what do you think about all this? Uh, it's again uh, our litigious uh, um, people. There's so many people that, that rely on the lawyers. I mean, you can see it with the ambulance chasers and things like that. Uh, they they just throw it at the wall and see what sticks. Uh, and they're looking for the person with the deepest bucks and deepest pockets. Uh, and in this case, it's uh, they're definitely going to go after Facebook for some way. Again, it, it's coming down to the lawyers. Uh, Facebook does, as Marty mentioned. Uh, heavily throttle right leaning and conservative leaning individuals and organizations heavily. So I, I don't know. I, I kind of have mixed feelings that Facebook's getting drug into it. But again, it's kind of like the spoon making the fat person fat or the, mm-hmm. the car for DWIs or guns for mass shootings and things like that. It's, yeah. it needs to go back to personal accountability. It's, I think that's the heart of the problem is we've lost personal accountability in this country and really in the world. Yeah. Let me offer a, a, an alternate viewpoint here. Like I, I, I don't like this lawsuit. Um, do people who do evil things use Facebook, Twitter and, you know, Google and all these other things? Yeah, probably. Do I think that the companies are held responsible? Not necessarily. The, I don't think that a company, I don't think that Smith and Wesson should be able to be sued when someone uses a gun for evil. I don't think, like you just said, Joe, I don't think Chevy should be able to be sued when someone uses a car in a drunk driving accident or something like that. And, you know, I don't, for the most part, think that all these platforms should be able to be sued for things that are said by individuals that use this platform for free. I think this is just kind of a ridiculous lawsuit. I'm not a hundred percent sure where it's going to go, but I kind of don't want it to go anywhere because if Facebook gets sued for this successfully, just imagine how hard they're going to crack down on anything that could be considered by them to be fringe, which yeah. in my opinion, gun content is not fringe at all, but Facebook, I think has a different opinion on that. I lost you. Yeah. If, if they, uh, yeah, I don't know if they get sued, I think it's bad for all of us in the, in the name of freedom personally. Absolutely. Uh, luckily, the gun industry, as far as manufacturers and dealers and things, we do have some protections that were put in place, and they've very, very successfully protected a lot of uh, companies uh, against that. Yet some companies still have had issues, like slide fire has gone under, uh, just because of their having to defend themselves and prove that there is protections for them on federal and state levels. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's specifically, I, I believe us, the tobacco industry, maybe a couple others are really the only industry that does have those protections, but those protections are still very expensive to, to utilize and, and have. Yeah, without uh, question. So if something does like that, then everybody's going to lobby for it. So all the media, Facebook, things like that, the people with the bucks are going to lobby for that protection on it. And then it's going to turn into just, again, the lawyers making money, no actual uh, social change or, or, or real change is going to happen. All right. So for me, uh, I think this next story is a little bit more positive. Texas man makes three mile shot to set a new record. He was using a, a rifle chambered in 408 shy tack, which destroyed the previous two records. 
of 3,800 yards and 4,210 yards, which were made with a 375 shy tack. Uh, this shot was a 5,280 yard shot. It was done with a rifle by, uh, let's see. I just had it. I'll say who the uh, Vestal's custom rifles, 390 gram bullet, 3,160 feet per second. It took 14 seconds to reach the target three miles away. And then probably equal amount of time for them to hear it when it came back. And he did it on his eighth shot. Joe, what do you think about that? I I love long range shooting. I love the theory about external ballistics and how it works. What's really impressive, it, it just didn't like, hey, add a few yards or a few hundred yards. This added over a thousand yards to the record. Yeah. Uh, I really would have loved to have seen like a three or a five shot impact group just to see what it is. Same. But it's still really, really impressive. Uh, it's really frustrating that there isn't a Guinness book of world records opening for that because as the article states, there's not an opening for optics. Yeah. Uh, so guns, weird. which where does that go? I mean, how does that fit tracking point style, uh, automated things or assisted things? I mean, at what point do you, do you shut it off? But I think it's a, it's an outstanding display of uh engineering it's a damn damn fine feat that guy is gonna have so that record's already been beat pretty it's already been beat already 61 the same guys done while we were at shot show oh jeez yeah Wait, where'd this come yeah this this article was just posted five days ago so but well, actually that happened in uh january of 2018 is when that shot happened i think we had actually thousand yard shot the the one that he's talking about the article there yeah that's the one uh, that Charlie Melton, I guess, beat Charlie Melton's, which his was right at that. I mean, his was like 5,025 or something like that. And then Melton did 6,100 at shot? No, Charlie didn't do that. That's actually somebody else who did that. Uh, so there's a 6,100? 6, yeah. That's three. With what, what kind of rifle? I don't know what that guy used, but I know what Charlie's going to use. <laughs> on his On his coming up April the 14th. Through the twentieth out in Utah, he's going to go shatter that sixty one hundred record. Are they using the uh, the little neck down twenty millimeter Vulcan rounds? No, so it's a modified Shytac. It's a Tejas round by uh, developed by Brad Stair of Performance Rifles. He's got a whole he's got a whole rifle and and round and everything that they're using. What caliber is it? Uh, the four hundred eight is the one he used the first time, but he's got anywhere from twenty two all the way up to fifty. BMG for that Tejas round. Crazy. Yeah. So amazing. the caliber, 22 caliber all the way up to 50 caliber. In the Te, yeah, in the Tejas. So 510. <laughs> She's probably going to stick around that 40 caliber, that 36 to 40 caliber in that. Uh, I would, I would presume. It's so uh, great. To get the ballistic coefficient and the sectional density that, that kind of has that sweet spot. Yeah. But I think, I think Guinness is going to have to recognize these guys uh, sooner or later because this is some amazing shots they're making. Just the scope or not. <laughs> I can yeah. barely even comprehend that distance in my mind. Like, you know, a mile is kind of difficult when you think about how far that actually is. A thousand yards, you're like, okay, yeah, I can, 10 football fields. I can, I can conceptualize that, but like three miles, like, I don't, I don't even know how no, to these do that. Are, these are the next county over kind of shots. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, 14 seconds of flight time at the 5,000 yards. Yes. Another thousand yards past that. The another bullets. Four. I don't know how they're staying. Charlie was like a and a half seconds. Uh, supersonic. Yeah, it, it, it's pretty amazing. The ballistics on this are pretty interesting. Uh, they're pointing it out over in the chat on YouTube, but seriously, that the the optic is mounted like a foot off of the rifle, which oh yeah, it makes sense. I mean, if you go to Charlie's Instagram page, he's got pictures. That sounds you fun. Can, you can see the rifle he used and and everything. Yeah, that's very fun. Hey guys, so next story comes to us from The Blaze, and the headline is, Florida School Isn't Looking for a Fair Fight, Hires Combat Vets for Security. I think this is fantastic. First off, they've hired them. The principal says, we're not looking for a fair fight. We're looking at an overwhelming advantage. Uh, they're going to carry, they're going to carry unchambered, and they're going to be walking around the schools and things like that. Parents have been generally accepting of the guards. The guards are making about $50,000 a year. Which is much higher than the allocation that the schools receive. That the schools receive each, or is that twenty five thousand each? Uh, it looks like it's fifty each, but I guess I can't. Good for be, them. Yeah, I can't be a hundred percent sure. And then uh, 
They each had to complete 132 hours of firearm safety and proficiency training from the Manatee County Sheriff's Department. Man, it seems like there's a lot of people that get it. What do you guys think, Joe, first? Uh, I think it's a good idea. I, I think arm, an armed presence is the right way to go. It, it is it's the sheepdog theory. I find it interesting the rifles that they're kind of choosing. Uh, the, they're, they're kind of, and it is from Florida, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so they're, they're grabbing a Florida based company. Uh, looks like the rifles are using, uh, which I, I find pretty awesome. But again, I, I was a high school teacher, uh, for over, over a decade and I always had access to a firearm and I was always prepared. Uh, one of our principals always had access to a firearm. We had our SRO officers that were always there and I always felt that we were fairly well protected, uh, kind of a, a rural school, but I do think it was the right direction and people knew that there were armed individuals there and it, and it kept them from doing anything like that. It, it really de-escalated situations when people kind of thought about it. It's like, Oh, there's a presence here, an armed presence yeah. or something of that nature. Yeah. It, it's definitely a, a, a good method to, um, discourage any kind of bad behavior. Now, Marty, I want to hear your thoughts, but I also want to point out that they're both military veterans and the principal said, I wouldn't hire anybody who hadn't, who hadn't been shot at and fired back. I need someone who's been in that situation so that they react correctly. Uh, what are your thoughts on the overall story and that statement as well? Uh, I'm, I'm for it. Obviously I'm for the uh, teachers being armed as well. As long as they have similar training like these have, these guys have obviously, I mean, they're not going to have the being shot at experience. Uh, combat military experience that these people are going to have. But like this guy said, he's taking it one step further. And I really like that. You know, he's, he's being serious about it. He's showing how serious he is about it by bringing in, you know, not just some, uh, wannabe cops, you know, security guards. He's paying these guys $50,000 each a year. And uh, it's not, I'm sure that's not a full time job for these guys. So I mean, that's a chunk of change. And somebody's getting paid that kind of money, you're paying for experience and you're paying for their expertise. So I like what this guy's doing and I hope other people follow suit. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think this is good. I think we're going to see more of it. And But I don't want to see any militia type people, you know. No, I want to see professionals. Yeah, I want to see yeah, quiet I like the veteran route that he's going. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, veterans, uh, I like the, the army of the teachers, uh, teachers that voluntarily do it and go through proper training. And take the, again, that personal accountability, uh, not only for themselves, but then their students and the school, because that's a, it's going to be a, a bit heavier load, uh, that they do have to carry. Uh, I don't think it's excessive. Again, I was in that position, uh, as a teacher and always felt that, that I could at least at minimum protect my classroom, if not a good portion of the school. We were a fairly large campus. Yeah, it's good stuff. I'm glad that we're. It would be nice. It would have been nice to be equipped with a RDB or a <laughs> rifle, uh, but I think again, in the cases of this, it's a um, it's a preventative. It's a you know what I like about it also is that it's, it's not a it's a display like you said. It's out yeah. there. People can see it. They know it's not one of these where they got to guess whether the teachers are armed or not. They know that this school's armed, and I guarantee you, nobody's going to go pick on that school because it's been advertised that you're going to get your ass shot. I would do. agree. I would agree. Next story. New ITAR rules will ease the burden on FFLs. We have talked about this on the show previously, but I think Joe, you're, uh, you're going to be affected by this. So basically what's going to happen. There was a document that was uh, reviewed by NBC news that said only for state internal use, but basically ITAR is uh, I'll let Joe explain it, but basically they're going to change it from the uh, state department to the department of commerce, which is going to decrease the fees by a couple thousand dollars a year. And uh, Joe, A, do you think that this will affect you? And B, is this a good thing in your opinion? And why? Uh, it's really it's it's really not going to affect me, the discount, because I only turn this a little bit. Uh, see that warning right there? Yes. Right there. All right. We are an ITAR compliant facility. We do do that. We're going to be continuing with ITAR uh, as far as export, the things we make. See that little gray thing right there that shoots it's a machine gun grenade launcher. Oh yeah. <laughs> that thing right there, those things right Little. there, all these things right here. So it, it's not going to affect us as far as the, the, uh, removing it out of, uh, DDTT or DDTC, uh, moving it into a different area. 
it's still going to affect us. We're still going to have to go through it. Uh, so as a company on our side, we are a manufacturer. I do, I'm a big proponent of it because I see a lot of small shops and I see it mentioned as a lot of hitches for other manufacturers, small R and D firms or, or small places that want to develop things and they are limited because that's another almost $3,000 to start with plus around $2,300 plus all of the, and what people don't understand is, yeah, the ITAR is 2250 to 2750 mm-hmm. or more, depending on your exports and what you make. Mm-hmm. But it's the things that you have to do to maintain ITAR compliance. That is infinitely more costly than, than that piece of paper and that DDTC form that you have to do yearly. Uh, so that eases a lot of the burdens on it. Uh, having specific individual compliance officers to keep track of just the changing rules and paperwork and things like that. It's an immense amount of upkeep for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's going to help those small gunsmiths that now reading at the rules on a lot of ATF agents are talking to these O1 and even some of these uh, 07 R and D people say, Hey, you're threading barrels and you're doing this, you're doing this. It's slightly outside of what you would consider gunsmithing. So now you're in manufacturing, you need to pay ITAR. Marty? And you're oh. not offering any technology that's above what is commercially viable or commercially used or freely exported and freely traded. Uh, and again, it's not the equipment that's the significant thing. It's the knowledge and the things about it. Uh, that's what's more, most securely backed, uh, core technologies, processes of how you get things, uh, material specs, heat treating specifications, all of those, that's the, that's the important things and the things that are much easier to lose and lose control of and cause problems. Makes sense. Marty, what are your thoughts? I'm going to pull a spin here and what Joe said. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yep. I, I'm like, I'm not smart enough to know what this all means, but Joe can tell us. Yeah, it's yeah. he did it's a, great a significant job. change, and I think it's I think it's a step in the right direction. And one of the things that Trump did uh, campaign on and mentioned that he was going to try and get straightened up. Uh, he's done a lot of things uh, to help, and small a lot of them are small incremental things. Like only people that are in industry, only people that are in this certain community will even hear about this. But it is a major change for people that that I mean, it's their livelihood or people that want to get in this this profession. Uh, it is a huge stumbling block whenever you're looking at your standard licensing plus business licensing plus commercial facilities and the security. And now you got to throw this, uh, what seems to be an arbitrary thing on something because, Hey, I want to do some serif coding and some threads on barrels. Yeah. And I mean, there's a lot of people that are probably in violation of ITAR because they don't pay the couple thousand dollars every year. And the, you know, if, if it came down to it, they could probably each you know, prosecuted or at least charged with some things. The fine, uh, it's a fine and it's a massive, massive fine. It's more than I think 20 years worth of the, uh, fees. If I'm not mistaken. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Incredible. Uh, Plus loss of the license. If you out, if you fall out of compliance in that area, now you're outside of compliance for your state and FFLs and all that other stuff too. So it's, it's a pretty significant thing. And that's, that's one of those things that it really is tough to keep up with all of the changing rules and regulations. Uh, it's, it's a tough industry. Yeah, definitely is. Uh, next story, Texas man gets eight years in prison for a 3d printed gun and a hit list of lawmakers. This comes to us from Fox news, but uh, you know, this guy, he was sentenced to eight years. Basically he was found with a gun partially. He shot off a couple rounds in the forest with an AR 15 style rifle uh, that was partially made from a 3d printer. He was a prohibited person because of a violent altercation with his girlfriend. It was, it was kind of an interesting thing. And he did have a hit list of us lawmakers. He was inspired by a shooting uh, a month before his arrest in Alexandria, Virginia, which left, it was the, the baseball, the congressional baseball thing. And uh, you know, they, they stopped him from doing bad things. He was a prohibited person and he got eight years for it. I think, you know, I think that's good. Marty, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it sounds like the guy was uh, illegally in possession of it, and he did an illegal thing with it, so he needs to be punished. Yep, totally agree. To the extent. Joe? I hate the headline of the story and the premise behind it. Yeah. Because 
he's not in jail for eight years because he 3D printed a gun and yada, yada, yada. Good point. He's in jail because he was possessing a firearm as a prohibited person. And he had a hit list. I mean, both of those things are pretty, pretty big no-nos, but it comes, it boils down to the fact that he is a prohibited person. There's already laws in place for him to not have a firearm. <laughs> I know. They're already there. Guess what? So, He's a criminal. What, what is this going to create? Uh, a 3D printed firearm at, at this stage in technology and even beyond. There's nothing that it's, going to be any different from taking a fence post out of your backyard and turning it into a stin gun mm-hmm. it, it it frustrates me the way that, that and they it, said it was partially so we don't even know what part was three it could have been the grip you know i think it was the that's receiver a good point. yeah he, that's a good point and it just it just goes just to show that, the like sensationalization said. that they do with everything the j- just the example of the title of the article is already biased. Yeah, Shocking all. You're Shocking right. All. This, this, I mean, the story really has nothing to do with the 3D printing or anything. It does say later on that he did print the lower receiver, which holds a fire control group and all that stuff. And he told his family members that he didn't buy a gun, that he built it, and that he printed a lower and built it, installed the trigger, and did all that stuff. But yeah, you're right, Joe, and I'm glad you brought it up. Like this 3D printing has nothing to do with the story. It's just a criminal doing criminal things and with plans to do more criminal things has been uh, caught by the justice system and punished appropriately. It, it's they're trying to again evoke an emotional response using the emotion rather than logical thinking to uh, orchestrate change, mm-hmm. orchestrate control. Yeah, I agree. All right, so guys, just imagine that you're sitting there, you're getting a root canal, they're drilling on, zzz, drilling on, drilling on you, and you suddenly hear gunfire at the dentist office. Well, this is basically what happened in Tennessee. Police are calling a man a hero for stopping a murder in a dental office. Uh, Guy walks into the dental office, his wife, ex-wife, love interest or whatever, shoots her, um, shoots her dead. Concealed carrier, I don't actually know if he's getting a root canal, but he was somewhere in the vicinity, heard it, shot the guy a couple times. Uh, the guy did not die, but, uh, then the concealed carrier, uh, stood over or stood by him until law enforcement arrived. And, you know, good guys win. I think that's always a good, a good one for us. Uh, Joe, what are your thoughts? It definitely stopped the bad guy. It was a, firearm that was there unfortunately it didn't stop the initial attack Mm -hmm. but i'm sure if police would have showed up at that at the worst time possible like right after he got there and there wasn't a concealed carry permit yeah i had a barricade situation hostage situation or he may just started offing people and offing himself yeah i mean so i i I hate playing what if what if what if but in in this case it stopped anything from getting any worse it's unfortunate somebody did lose their life uh, one of the questions that kind of pops into my head is, is if he was getting a root canal or was there for even minor surgery and he was destined to have some kind of anesthesia, at what point would he be not in a good position to be carrying a firearm? Good point. Uh, and I, it, I would, I would, it doesn't say in the it article, it, it doesn't just says say, he was yeah. a patient. Yeah. Uh, He's probably just there for a cleaning. Yeah. If he was, I, every, every six months I go in for a cleaning. Uh, I talk, uh, our, my dentist, uh, we talk about guns and BS about guns and suppressors and things all the time. Yep. Same. Uh, Marty, what do you think? No, definitely a hero. I mean, the guy did, uh, textbook what you're supposed to do as a concealed carry, uh, person, you know, with at least what you, uh, I don't want to say that what you train to do, but fortunately he was there and he stopped the situation. I think it took like the police six minutes to get there. So this all went down really quick. And, uh, the guy came in through the back. He was an older guy, 63, uh, shoots his wife, the patient then takes care of the, the shooter and holds him at gunpoint until the police arrive. Uh, and they said it took him like six minutes to get there. So he could have gone on a, you know, rampage, shot everybody else in that office uh, if it hadn't been for this guy. Yeah, it definitely could have. I, I agree. We, uh, I feel like we sometimes have to, you know, follow things through to possible resolutions just to kind of learn from them. So, you know, we can prepare for all the different scenarios. Uh, and I will say for, you know, a concealed carry person, you know, if he was under anesthesia of any kind, if he was on laughing gas, if he called nine one one, he was like, I guess I'm a hacker because his mouth was all numb. Like you never know. And that's why yeah. we talk about second call defense on this show, uh, firearms TV slash SCD. And that basically they do have self defense insurance and they do cover you in situations like this. Uh, day one, dollar one, they make sure you have attorneys that everything's paid for. You're never out of pocket. 
and uh, just go check it out. See what you think and, and let us know if you have any questions. Next story. Two Las Vegas men arrested for stealing guns from shot show vendors. This is this is crappy. It's oh, 65 firearms and suppressors were stolen by these two union uh, forklift drivers at shot show. <laughs> I want to talk about real quick how they were caught uh, because shot show, everything's disabled. There's no firing pins and guns. So the ATF called all the local uh, Las Vegas gun stores and things and put out an alert, which I've seen a lot of these. It's usually a, a, like a robo call or something or, or they make a, a personal call to them and they told them to be on the lookout for people wanting firing pins. Literally the next day, uh, an FFL holder called into the ATF and said there were people in here. They bought a shotgun, but they were asking a lot of questions about firing pins of AR 15s. The ATF showed up, went to their apartment, found all the guns. These guys are going to federal pound me in the uh, federal prison. And Marty, what what are your thoughts here? <laughs> Jack wagons. Definitely. <laughs> yes. I'm just surprised that something like this hasn't happened sooner. At it, shot show. It happens every year. It does. I figured it probably did every uh, year. I just don't hear about oh. it. I'm going to see if we can do some finagling. They were uh, over I, ambitious. I really like the way that they got caught. Uh, it, it, it warms my soul, uh, because it does seem, uh, kind of funny. <laughs> there we go. That's better. I was like, I don't know what's happening. That's better. Get that money. All right. In so, there. uh, yeah, they go in. Uh, normally what happens is like when an AR 15, the firing pin is ground down. So the firing pins there it still holds everything together. And more than likely, all of these guns, all these firearms have some manner of deactivation, which is required by SHOT Show. And it just goes to show you how we're required to use these union people to bring stuff in and out. That's the thing. And how And the holes that are in the security that they provide. But again, they're ballpark probably 100,000 firearms at SHOT Show at a given time. And this this was a little bit larger and more excessive of of the ones that I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. uh, typically, it's somebody snags some optics or a few rifles or a PDW or something like that. Pulls it out the side of a case because it got busted open. Uh, this is a really big example, so it it is getting some pretty good headlines. Uh, but every year it does happen, and it's almost one hundred percent outside of the actual show time with the responsible parties in control of their stuff. Yeah. And yep. Union guys, both former, uh, for, former criminals, I believe I read and it, it does suck. Joe alluded to it, but yeah, these guys are required to use this union labor and you know, it kind of takes everything out of their hands and then you trust these union laborers to do the thing. And look, I'm not trying to say that union laborers are, are crappy or that they're awful people or criminals or anything. I just, it, it stinks that this stuff does happen pretty much every year and yeah. people like Atlas defense are required to use this labor. There's no other option. That's it. It's incredibly expensive and uh, you end up putting a lot of control on people that may not uh, deserve to have that control. Next story. Dems reintroduced 10 round magazine ban. This comes to us from gunsamerica.com. Story is just a couple days old, but it's as bad as you think. They've, uh, they've reintroduced legislation that would ban Americans from importing, selling, manufacturing, transferring, or possessing all magazines capable of holding more than 10 rounds. It's called the Keep Americans Safe Act. It would allow those who already own standard capacity magazines to keep them. It wouldn't apply to 22 tube mags, but it would ban the transfer of outlawed magazines and over time eliminate most standard capacity mags from mid and full size semi automatic handguns as well as the most popular mags for semi automatic rifles. Uh, this comes to us from, uh, Senator from Florida and New Jersey, which is kind of interesting. And they're, you know, they're, they're going full hog as it were. Marty, what do you think? Well, I mean, we're seeing, we see this every, every cycle, every political cycle. Uh, they're just, you know, throwing their spitballs. They throw everything out there. They throw everything at us, and, you know, and the kitchen sink and they just keep throwing at us and they throw it at us in several different ways as well. I mean, you know, They've got the assault weapons ban that they're, you know, reintroducing. It's just, it's their strategy. You know, the more they throw at us, the more likely they're going to get one through. What I don't understand is why we as second amendment proponents and, you know, our side of things, why don't we hit them and inundate them with more stuff that we want implemented? <laughs> you know, I want laser guns, you know, let's make those, let's make those legal. Let's make grenade launchers legal. Let's make, you know, let's get rid of the NFA. Let's, you know, why aren't we, pushing and trying to get all this stuff passed through. We just sit and, and be reactive to their 
uh, you know, to their assaults on us. Yeah, that's, that's definitely fair. Joe? It, again, it, goes, it boils down to that immer- emotional reaction. Uh, they're trying to use emotion against and increase the control. It's very hard once things are started to unravel and undo them. Uh, a lot of people, they kind of go back to the HPA, the Hearing Protection Act, that was a, a failed attempt to make suppressors and over the counter or even a Title One thing. A uh, Title One thing is like normal gun. You go in and do 4473 and walk out. Title Two items are NFA items, short barrel shotgun silencers and so on. Uh, so the HPA was trying to unravel some of the things as far back as 1934. And there are laws that are tied to those laws that are tied to those laws federally that states have tied to those laws. So there's this millions of lines of, of laws and things that have to be unraveled to get it done. So just one little movement, it's, it's so complex. And once they start looking into this and realizing what's going on, it just, it makes it a lot harder for us to get that done. So I think what we do, we, we do have to focus on stopping new things. I would really, really like to unravel some of this stuff, but it is a lot harder to do because of those, because of all the unravelings. That but we we've got to, do. we've got to start pushing our views and our wants and our needs through as well, just like they're doing and get them caught up and distracted on trying to stop us and instead of us trying to stop them. It's really hard to argue a logical argument to an emotional person. <laughs> it, yeah, that, that's um, the truth, man. And it's, I mean, look at all of the new house members and how politically radical and emotional they are now. Yeah. I mean, we, we have put our trust in the system that is allowing, I, I, I don't have a word for it, but I'm sure you have the sentiment that's allowing people that, that have that emotional response rather than a logical response. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's America these days. Emotion rules everything, but hold on to your pants guys, because that 10 round mag limit is not, it's just the tip of the iceberg. There's also yeah, just the tip. Uh, yeah. The Dems file another assault weapons ban in Congress. You may remember the assault weapons ban from a, a decade ago now, I guess, but house Democrats have introduced a plan to bring back the long expired federal ban on assault weapons. A couple of important things here is this has no sunset. The other one was 10 years and then it went away uh, if they couldn't pass it again. And this one has no such thing. It would ban the importation, production, or transfer of 205 firearms by name to include a myriad of semi-automatic AR-15, AK-47 variants, uh, any semi-auto rifle with a detachable magazine, and any military-style features such as a barrel shroud, pistol grip, threaded barrel would be caught in the net. Um. In addition to this, they've introduced a bunch of other stuff like pushing the time limit on background checks. So basically if you, uh, they would change things to where there's no longer a default to proceed, which is I think three days right now. If you don't get a response back from the 4473, the, the FFL holder can choose to sell the firearm to the individual. Yeah. This basically takes that away, which could, they could conceivably, uh, just stop processing background checks because of budget mm-hmm. issues with air quotes or something else and just basically have a de facto gun ban. They, they have uh, introduced a bill to change rifle caliber pistols and add them to the NFA. So $200 tax stamp for, you know, any of the rifle caliber pistols, AR pistols, things like that. Require tax stamps, $200 a pop for rifles with detachable magazines. So every AR-15, AK-47, 74, whatever. And the 80% is now the new 100% when it comes to firearms receivers. So getting rid of 80s and Palmer 80s and everything else like that. I mean, th- this is a freaking disaster, Marty. Yeah. It's a disaster. It's what it is. And we've, we've let them get to this point. And that's where we have to exercise our right and our voice. And we have to inundate our legislators, our lawmakers and let them know where we stand on this. And you know, you can't sit back and be idle because that's, that's why we are where we are today. I mean, look at the statement that was it Pelosi made the other day in response to, to Trump invoking the, presidential. Yeah. And we're going to talk about that one too. Building the wall. You know, I mean, she just came out and said it that, you know, we'll come back and we'll take your guns away. You know, same way he's going to try to get his wall done. So they're not hiding behind words anymore. They're coming out and saying exactly what they're going to do. They're, they're coming after us. They're going to take everything away. Yeah. There's, there's, yeah, there's no longer a facade about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. They, they've often said, 
Look, we're just, uh, we're looking for rational common sense gun control. We're not trying to take your guns away. We're just looking for solutions to the problems for the children. And yeah, they're not, they're not even pretending anymore. They're just complete and utterly coming after. Mm. Well, they go after you know, the children, the feelings, emotions. That's, mm-hmm. that's what they target in, in people. And yep. Uh, former, we got to fight fire with fire. No, I agree, Marty. I, I 100% agree. You're right. We need to, mm-hmm. we need to be on the offensive a lot more than we have been and a lot more than we are. I think. Yeah, it's it's kind of a crazy time. Uh, former employee kills five in Aurora, Illinois. This is a guy who was a prohibited person. He had passed his initial background check. A month later, he had failed the next one. They took away his conceal his firearms FOID card, but they didn't seize his guns. Well, they were going to fire him. They informed him that they were going to fire him. I guess, and he he went berserk and killed five people in the two hundred person factory. And you know, it's you know. He was prohibited. He was a criminal. He was doing criminal things. Joe? It's absolutely tragic. Uh, uh, but, but again, somebody there licensed, legally carrying or unlicensed, uh, cause I don't, I don't think that there should be licensure for carry. Uh, I think it should be a constitutional thing. It's stated yep. that we should have these allowances. It is kind of a hard thing to look at states' rights versus federal overture, but the states were a part of that federal uh, overlook. So I think that it, the Second Amendment should very much comply to it. So I think there should have been and could have been some concealed carriers or somebody there that was armed that could have that could have helped. Yeah, I mean, five cops were shot, five or six people were killed. It's just a disaster, Marty. Well, the guy should have never had the fires to begin with if if they would have followed through with what they were supposed to have done to begin with and uh, seized his weapons, you know, I'm not saying that he still couldn't have gone out and barred one or stole one from somebody and, and done this because an evil person is going to do evil things. You're not going to be able to stop them. You're going to be able, you can minimize, you know, like Joe said, you know, if somebody was carrying there, if we had constitutional carry, then it could have been minimized at some point. I'm sure. But the, uh, the laws are I- in place. I didn't actually get to see this article. Uh, what was the, was there a mention of the prohibitive event between purchases? Yeah, there was. I just closed that tab. Let me see if I can get it back here. Let's see. He, months later, second background check found a 1995 aggravated assault conviction in Mississippi involving the stabbing of an ex-girlfriend. So domestic violence, boom, immediate prohibited person. That's it. Yeah. So uh, they sent him a letter saying his gun permit had been revoked and they ordered him very sternly that he had to turn in his firearms to the, to the police. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I just, it, guys, it comes back to like, we have enough laws on the books, man. Just enforce the laws we have. Like this guy wouldn't have. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Just follow through. Yeah, I mean, maybe don't you don't have to enforce them. Yeah. Ridiculous. Well, there is a, there is a lack and a disconnect in a lot of reporting agencies and reporting facilities. And that's one thing that a lot of the bands want to do is to create this large centralized database, which I don't believe is a good thing. It may, it may ease some of the issues, but again, the laws are not going to protect somebody that is not, that, that's a, that's a that legal owner of a gun from snapping at that point. It's the person that's there on the scene, the good guy that can stop that. And we need more of those people to take that responsibility of not only themselves, their family, but be a citizen. Mm-hmm. An evil person is going to do evil things. And like, like you said, you can't stop them. You can just, you can hope to minimize it. Yep. Yeah. Kentucky sheriff suspends law, law enforcement in, in Kentucky, uh, in a portion of Kentucky, a county due to lack of funds, tells everyone, lock your doors, load your guns and get a dog. So perfect. Uh, yeah. There That's you go. That's the way it should be. Don't <laughs> yeah. rely don't rely on the government to protect you. Yep. If the sheriff's office can't protect you, who will? Well, you know what? It's not their responsibility. They have no duty. There's precedent on this. They don't have a duty to protect. Guys, it, like yeah. just like everybody else. If you don't have the money for this and that, I mean it has to be things have to be cut. Uh I think the the federal government has lost sight of that because they have the ability of just creating money out of thin air and, and taking on loans that they know they'll later 
Uh, the interest rates will change and things like that. So they're just creating money. I think if everybody took kind of the, the lead of what this sheriff's doing and work within the funds that you have, don't, don't push out and don't press out. Uh, I find that the whole government shutdown that, that federally was pushed over a five billion dollar expenditure, mm-hmm. which was on a, uh, what was it? A, a four trillion dollar budget? Yeah. A several trillion dollar budget. Uh, it, I mean, that, that it's literally almost nothing. I agree. Um, fiscal responsibility. I applaud mm-hmm. the sheriff. Hey, we don't have the money to, to do this. You, you're now down to, you have to protect yourself. Yeah. A hundred percent. It's like, like Sean said earlier, it's, it's not their, it's not in their job description to do that to begin with. Supreme, they, Supreme you ask Court. Them, they'll tell you that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they have no duty to protect us as citizens. That's why we have the second amendment. And you know what? Let's have everyone shut down and just have, you know, we'll, we'll give everyone a gun at the age of 18 and uh, we'll, we'll stop all law enforcement unless it's murder or something like that. And, We'll see how things go. I'm down with that. I'm down. Uh, Let's do it. Guys, when sometimes when someone fails a 4473, which is the form that you have to fill out when you when you purchase a firearm, when someone fails that background check, sometimes the police show up. I've seen it a couple times uh, here in mm-hmm. Colorado Springs. Sometimes it happens. A lot of times nothing happens. But now there has been a change very recently where it is a requirement now to report the denial to uh, the chief law enforcement agency. And this is a change that is that has been uh, implemented over the last four and a half months or so. So there is a lot more rollouts. I've seen it several times at shows where there's a denial, it's faxed in or called in, and the dude doesn't even make it out of the show. And there's a call and he's in, he, and he's in bracelets. Good. Yeah. I mean, that, I think that's how it should be. Now, Democrats, yeah. they approve legislation to require background checks universally for all sales and transfers of the firearms, but they rejected GOP led efforts to amend the legislation to alert law enforcement right. authorities when gun buyers, including illegal immigrants, fail those background checks. So you, me, Marty, the listeners, when we fail, they, they want the, they want the cops called and whatever. When an illegal immigrant fails a background check, you know, don't call ICE. That, that's, it's not going to work for us. I think that's, ridiculous marty what do you think <laughs> makes no sense I, mean, I can't i cannot i can't bring myself to the level of ignorance that these people have i mean i am ignorant in a lot of things but even that just dumbfounds me it, I, I, don't get I it. truly it's not ignorance at all uh they are protecting their voter base yes. they are building and growing that voter base it, but how do people not see that i mean we we understand and we see that but how do uh, how does the general public not understand what they're doing? I know it's frustrating. I know it's uh, it, it really is frustrating. Like I don't even understand how I, I've read the article twice. I don't understand what their, what their point is. Like, why would they not want illegal immigrants, people who are here taking funds illegally using public utilities and services illegally uh, contributing to crime in some cases? Like, why would we not want to get criminals People who are here illegally breaking our laws, even if they're, uh, even if they're those laws, like why would we not want them to, to be gone? It just doesn't make any sense. It, it defies logic in my opinion. Well, yeah. when people figure out a way to legislate themselves security, uh, i.e. food stamps, housing, things like that, that has always been the ball rolling to the failure of all, not just some but all constitutional republics. And I think we're right there. And unless we do something post haste, it's, it's going to be the fall of of our constitutional republic. And it's going to have, it's going to require a reorganization and, and kind of a, a a hit that restart button and none of it's going to be good. And it's, it's not going to be good for anybody. Uh, The people that are like, Oh, I'll, can't wait for a civil war and things like that. That's going to be one of the most terrifying, miserable things that you could ever imagine. I, I can't imagine people being, or, or being when the civil war happened. Uh, but I think that may be the only thing that, that can course correct what's going it's, on. It's because it goes back to they're, they're trying to undo our history as well and teach our history. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, history is doomed to repeat itself. And that's the problem is they're trying to, 
are trying to change our history. I think we've eclipsed the longest other constitutional republic lasting by about 50 or 60 years now. Interesting. Which in the long scheme, in the scheme of things, isn't very long. No. Nope. In, in the history. <laughs> which is why, which is why monarchs and royalty have been able to control and, and keep that way going much longer because they, there's that one person controlling it. And it goes against everything that we value as a republic, but it, it does have proven longevity. Not that I'm advocating in any way, shape, or form. I love the idea of the constitutional republic, and, I, and I'm really proud that we are the longest running, and, and hopefully we can figure out a way to make it continue and, and keep rolling. Yeah. Uh, just a point of clarification real quick. I'm not saying that anyone who fails or gets denied on a 4473 should be instantly arrested. I assume that there's some reason that they got declined and that would be passed on to law enforcement for law enforcement. Yeah. To, to if then a say, felony comes up. Right. Then, yeah. Yeah. I'm not saying a, a failure should be instant arrest or anything like that. Just to be clear. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I understood what you're saying. Okay, cool. Over in chat, there was a little bit of discussion, so I just wanted to nip that in the bud. Denver uh, police officer, 70 miles north of me, suspended for discharging his weapon when he meant to turn on the flashlight. So they're investigating womp, womp, womp. <laughs> investigating a robbery. Uh, guy's hiding under a car. The officer has his firearm out. I'm totally down with all this. And then goes to engage or to turn on his weapon-mounted flashlight and instead squeezes off around which hits near the suspect's head or the not suspect but the individual's head hits the tire <laughs> and the officer gets suspended now just a warning shot it was just a warning shot a shot over the bow i don't want to i don't want to poo poo the officer or anything like that like i'm not sure if it was like a squeeze thing and it was that that grasp response or if it was you know like an enforce where it's got the switch on the side or the tlrs or i don't really know what it is but there's a lot of it argu- could happen. Yeah, there's a lot of argument on the internet uh, as to whether a weapon-mounted light or a handheld light is the better idea. I don't really know which one, which way I go. I just think that a the officer's lucky. B it's kind of a weird thing that happened. Joe, what do you think? Training, uh, there's training required. Uh, I'm not a big fan of a weapons-mounted light as a primary. Uh, I think that's a secondary or, or tertiary light that you should have. I think you should have a standalone light. Uh, it just, it, it goes against any training from when you're a kid. I mean, again, don't point at things you're not willing to destroy. Oh, wait, let me put this thing that I can't see anything unless I point it at it. Right. I think it, it's, it's meant not as a primary thing. And anybody utilizing a weapons light as a primary thing, it, it fails the idea of what's, what's behind it. It's designed to help you aid and shooting the target so it fails the american the target, now laws of rule rule of laws yeah i think other other countries don't i think weapon mounted that. lights are fine actually i just think that when you're trying to search for somebody i would maybe use a handheld personally exactly yeah 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 I've, I've, I've been testing several the the dual fuel lights lately uh-huh I've come across some really good dual fuel and the ones that USB recharge. Oh, nice. I'm really, really getting into those. So I've been, I've tried out four or five different companies. Don't, don't start me on, uh, battery technologies and things. <laughs> oh, that's battery technology is one of our most limiting factors right now. Yeah. Uh, and there's some really neat stuff coming out. And one of them is the, the rechargeable lithium polymer stuff that is in a lot of the, the, USB charging stuff. It's phenomenal, man, phenomenal stuff. Yeah, this this could get into a way longer conversation just about that. I'm we'll have you on talking, Lynn. We'll talk about it on there. There you go. Uh, let's it's move in. Going to be a topic. I love it, man. Let's move into our just our last segment, our last story, and then I want to hear from you guys. Uh, woman holds mountain lions are having a really tough week. So first off, in Colorado, we had a mountain lion. A guy was jogging. Mountain lion attacks him. He chokes it out and kills it. And then runs three more miles, uh, wounded and bleeding. What? Yeah. Yeah. Totally <laughs> happened. Just killed him with his, he killed it with his bare hands. Exactly. There's a panther, Joe. Watch out. Uh, this story comes to us. Woman holds mountain lion while husband shoots it. So on January 30th, a woman thought she was stopping a dog fight. She ended up holding a 35 pound juvenile mountain lion instead. Uh, the woman restrained both her dog and the mountain lion while yelling for her husband, who was still inside the house, to grab a gun. He came out, responded, and quickly dispatched the mountain lion as she held on to it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a mountain woman right there. Yeah. Boy. 
she was holding the dog, holding the mountain lion, and somehow not being murdered. That's uh, that's one bad woman right there. You don't <laughs> want to mess with her. Uh, but we all How know. How big was this one? Uh, Thirty-five pounds. Okay. Uh, you need to put her at the schools as security. Yeah, that's like. Well, a, I think the other one, the dude, it was around a forty-five pound. Yeah, it was a, which also juvenile, but still not three times the size and weight of this thing. Yeah, like I'm afraid of house cats, man. Like um, a mountain lion, give me a break. It's it's he's he's a bad cat. He I I don't, I don't want to tangle with him when he gets a bad attitude. Yeah, I can't imagine something twice or three times the size, or even even a full grown adult. Uh, that's a lot of really. Well designed and a lot of uh, evolution for a killing machine. I want to get back to the guy who choked one out, <laughs> dude. This, all right. So the thing attacks him. He he gets it. He eventually gets his uh, knee on its back legs because you know when cats get turned on their back, they start clawing with their back feet. And he he got that, and then he was able to get his right foot on its neck, and he was able to stand on its neck until it died. Is there video of this? No, no. He was alone. No. He was alone jogging oh. here in Colorado. I'm sure it's going to turn out turn out to be some like failed grinder meetup or something. But as the story stands right now, <laughs> it was a mountain. He line. looks. The cat took some chunks out of him. I saw yeah. some of the interview footage, and he's cut up pretty good. Yeah, he like definitely I said, is. I, I do not want to. I would not want to tangle with any wild feline at all Mm-mm. me either so as a public service announcement the idaho government has uh basically given out some suggested responses when you come across a mountain lion since this is the second story in like two weeks i feel like we need to talk about it so here here's what to do if you're encountering a mountain lion do not run if you are with children pick them up without bending over do not turn your back on the lion crouch down or try to hide remain facing the lion and slowly back away leave an animal leave the animal an escape route Try to appear as large as possible. Stand on a rock or stump. Hold up your arms. Stand next to others. Shout, wave your arms, throw objects if the lion does not leave the area. Fight back if a mountain lion attacks. Stay on your feet and use sticks, rocks, backpack, hands to fight back. And use bear spray if you have it. Never approach a mountain lion or offer it food. And bring extra underwear just in case you poop or pee a little bit in your pants. <laughs> I added the last one, but I still think it's I want to know how they came up with this list of things to do. <laughs> it's the same list for bears. It is. And almost any other predator. <laughs> it is. Same list for, or for just every day walking around in real, in real life being, not being situational uh, awareness. Yep. I yeah. agree. Or just carry a gun and shoot it in the face. I mean, that's, that's also an option. I think, but you'll probably get killed or you'll probably get thrown in prison for poaching. If that happens. Uh, guys, that's that's all the time we've got for stories, but I do want to hear from you guys. What? Yeah, that's it, man. What? That's all we got. We no got more story time. No more story time. Uh, so tell our listeners where they can find you and what you've been up to. And I'll start with you, Marty. I'm right here. Okay, See good. Me right here. Yep, I'm they here. can find you right here, right now. <laughs> Talkingled.com. Uh, everywhere, we're everywhere. Just Google us. Uh, we got lots of good things coming up. We did over 30 interviews at Shot Show. Uh, been in the process of releasing those. Uh, we had a great interview with World War II vet Al Mamprey, the last surviving member of Easy Company. That's posted, ready to go. We just posted one with Butch Whiting of Cryptech. He uh, talked to us a little bit about the uh, the history of Cryptech, and uh, we hit him with the new guy questions that you guys are familiar with on Talking Land. And uh, we've got several more coming up. We got um, Taylor Guitars, uh, Bob Taylor from Taylor Guitars. Uh, so we talk a little bit about everything on Talking Lead. We talk music, we talk guns, we talk gear, we talk training, we talk cats, <laughs> Joe. And we're going to talk lights with Joe, and we've got this new thing called the AK Corner, Joe. And uh, we're going to get Joe on that, too, and we're going to talk uh, suppressing the AK-47s. I love it, man. Yeah. And, Marty, you've got, like, a, a class with ICE Training Company, right? And we've got some uh, some training classes that we're working with uh, several trainers around the country. We're kicking it off with Rob Pincus over at ICE Training. Uh, we've got one in Nashville coming up April the 6th. And then we've got one in uh, Pala, California, and I think Exeter, California. And that's thanks to Kenny uh, organizing that with us and uh, Jerry Black for the one in Nashville. But you guys can go to ICE Training's website. I think it's icetraining.us. And you can sign up for those courses. Let them know you're a leadhead. You get a discount on those courses. I love it, And then it, we're working on some long-range precision courses with Charlie Melton uh, and some other other ones I can't talk about yet. 
All right. That's awesome. When, we need to train again, Marty. It's been five years. It's been a minute. Yeah, man. I love to. Let's do it. Yeah. We need come to come down to Nashville out. and you go to that one. That would actually be fun. Let's see. Uh, April 6th and 7th, I'll actually be in Louisiana, Joe's neck of the woods then, but maybe uh, California in July. Right. Well, we're going to do another one in Nashville in the fall too. All right. I love it, man. Joe, what, uh, well, Mar- yeah, Marty, that sounds like some awesome stuff. Uh, I definitely want to keep an eye on it and kind of participate in that. So, uh, doing some great stuff with that. Uh, here at Aquas Defense, uh, Again, we are weapons evolved and ever increasing suppressed technologies. Uh, so our suppressor technologies is, uh, our suppressor technologies are growing, uh, every day. Uh, we're releasing things that have, you don't normally see from our future proof systems. So a lot of times people buy a suppressor and they're stuck with that same technology. Uh, after they wait the background check, by the time they get it, it's already outdated. Well, with our suppressors, we are future-proof systems. Uh, while they're in jail here, if we have an update or an upgrade or a change, then uh, we automatically do that. After your purchase, it can be easily done. Uh, so we, we integrate that future-proof technology in all of our suppressors, from our 22 that we've been selling for seven years uh, to our latest and greatest 556 can, which is one of the quietest, and it's an indoor hearing-safe dedicated 556 can. So on a 556 rifle, it's under 132 dBs. Uh, so we're really releasing some uh, revolutionary, some really cool stuff. Again, we're having a lot of fun doing it uh, with our grenade launchers and machine guns and the black cat here. Uh, that's ZK. He's our shop foreman. Uh, if you notice, he's been kind of up in the way and kind of pestering everything. Yeah. Whereas my dog has been politely laying over there just being just fine, uh, being a polite dog. So ZK wants uh, to kill you right now. He's looking at you. No, he's like thumping. It's like, hey, pet me. Pet me, pet me. <laughs> I'm not paying attention to him. Uh, so, again, our suppressed technologies, uh, check out atlasdefense.com. Uh, check out our Facebook pages, Instagram, uh, YouTube channels. Keep an eye out for what we're doing. We do some some really interesting stuff. Uh, if you're ever in the Baton Rouge area, uh, definitely come on by the shop. We've got uh, a showroom here. We can We can live fire demo suppressors. Uh, most people don't really know what a suppressor sounds like. They've got a lot of they have sound misconceptions. What's that? I said they have sound. They do. They sound like uh, some of them. Some of them are are true. I guess silencers. Uh, I love the conversation that we get where uh, we'll have our demo out there and we'll have a sign that said uh, silencers on it, and people get so frustrated. It's like. It's not really a silencer. It doesn't silence anything. <laughs> like, uh, well, I, the, the ATF requires us to call these things silencers. Every time I put it on a piece of paper, it's a silencer. Uh, the initial patent of these things was a silencer. I mean, it's just, it's the name of it. It's, it is, it is. It, yeah. So it, it, it's funny. It's kind of like the guys that get all crazy about the magazines versus clips things. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's hey, true. don't. Magazine clip it just man. creates strife in our community. If I can kind of close it out with that is, uh, suppressor people or the guys that hunt, uh, or the hardcore NFA guys or the training guys or the guys that, Hey, I carry a gun and Oh my God, you're not carrying medical too. All of these people, we need to, we need to be, we're of very similar mindset. We need to get in line and go forward so we can do the things that Marty mentions to get a cohesive fight against them and we fight back on it. So I think that's one of our biggest losses in the industry. Uh, so here at Aquas, that's kind of what we, what we want to do is, is provide simple, easy use products for everybody, not just for that one segment of people. I love it. And, and real quick, I, for some reason, I'm not able to type messages to people, but, uh, the AK corner, we've got, uh, four more AKs that we're giving away. So it's a 12 part series. We're giving away 12 total. We've got four more to give away. So tune into that. Dang. I love it. Talkingled.com for Marty and everything he's up to. Atlas Defense for Joe and everything he's up to. Joe, I am going to visit you. I will text you after the show and tell you when I'm going to be there. I was talking to Zach already a little bit. So I can't wait to, to be out there in Louisiana. I'm going to be there in the middle of crawfish season. Which, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right now, right, right now they're a little pricey. It's okay, man. Uh, I, I, I've, every time I've ever been out there, it's been not crawfish season. 
this will be the first time I've been there when it's actually in season. So I'm pretty. I may excited. have to definitely, skip the pinkest class. Come by and see us. I will, man. All right, guys. Thank you so much to everyone who listened. Thank you to uh, Joe and Marty for being here. I truly, truly appreciate it. Check out Patriot Patch Company at PatriotPatch.co or Second Call Defense at FirearmsRadio dot tv slash scd and uh you know don't forget guys this week in guns is produced by kenny ortega it's a production of the firearms radio network i truly appreciate everyone who listens and want to hear feedback from you guys so let me have it i'll talk to y'all soon i'll see y'all next week word <laughs>